First, to the tragic death of a 27-year-old man, the youngest death in the country from COVID in this current cluster. Aoud al Askar from Sydney's southwest had been isolating at home after testing positive. On day 13, he went downhill fast. He collapsed and couldn't be revived. Aoud was not vaccinated. Young Australians haven't been the priority with the rollout, but the need for them to get the jab now with this Delta strain is more important than ever. Throw together a scarce supply of liquid gold, constantly changing advice and a pack of brawling pollies. What does that get you? A recipe for hesitancy. I do not want under 40s to get AstraZeneca. We'll continue to welcome people over 60 that want the AstraZeneca. Don't take medical advice from, from, from members of parliament. Use of the Pfizer vaccine uh, is preferred over the AstraZeneca vaccine. To ensure as many Australians are vaccinated as early as possible and within the available supply. With our country's leaders unable to agree, it's little wonder why young Australians are confused. Tonight, we hit the streets to ask them what they think about the vaccine rollout. A lot of people have this opinion, that opinion. Enthusiastic, yes, in terms of, I guess, the greater good. Um, you'd like to do your part, but yeah, I guess a little bit of hesitancy. We've been promised freedom from lockdowns once the country reaches a 70% vaccination target as early as mid-November, something that may hinge on the nation's young men. Would you take the vaccine? Probably not. Who are lagging behind when it comes to rolling up their sleeves? Why do you think that is? Maybe just the stigma about them thinking they're invincible. Lockie says he'd take the jab but admits he isn't sure what the latest advice is. Especially when the communication towards young people is a bit lacking. I think it's a lot more confusing than any normal vaccine since there's a lot of different information and there's been so much contradictory information around this whole pandemic. So I haven't taken the vaccine yet but I'm really thinking about it because back in my country the situation is very bad. Electrical engineering student Sharky says the mixed messaging has left him anxious. So right now I'm really confused about it because I have heard that people are having blood clotting issues with the, with the vaccines. So that, that's why and I, have, I have asked uh, some of my friends that are they going to take it and they're really not sure about the blood clotting thing. That's why they're a little in a dilemma right now. The outgoing chairman of the country's top medical research body, Professor Bruce Robinson, has slammed a Targi's advice on AstraZeneca as wrong, leading a growing chorus of top medical minds demanding all restrictions on the AZ vaccine be scrapped as the Delta variant shows no signs of slowing down. What I would love to see happen is some of those people in Australia who had made the decision not to take AstraZeneca and wait for Pfizer to change their mind. Dr Nick Coatesworth is Australia's former Deputy Chief Medical Officer and Infectious Diseases Physician at the Canberra Hospital. We all have a responsibility for the messaging around AstraZeneca, whether it's ATAGI, whether it's government, whether it's academics and specialists like myself. And the important thing that we have to do now is all band together behind the vaccines that we have available. The latest data shows only 13% of Aussies aged between 20 and 24 have had their first jab, compared to 42% in the 40 to 44 age bracket and 63% in the 60 to 64s. That means that every five days, one million jabs are going into people's arms. So uh, as long as that can be maintained, then I'm very satisfied we're going to hit the targets as soon as we can. Dr Coatesworth says the time for everyone is right now. I agree that every Australian that wants to get vaccinated at the moment should take the vaccine that's available to them. And if that is AstraZeneca, then yes, they should take AstraZeneca. It is a safe, effective vaccine for COVID-19. I think it hasn't, it's been researched enough and lots of money has obviously gone into it, but there's not enough long-term research for me, I think. We just have to look at the rest of our vaccination program. We're a vaccination nation. The side effects that we know about for vaccines are short-term immediate side effects and they don't have long-term side effects. Well, I got mine done a few weeks ago. Really? So I'm with it. 22-year-old nursing student, Catherine. What do you think about it, that a lot of young people are a bit 
hesitant to take the vaccine? I just feel like they're not really experiencing science to know much about it, honestly. <laughs> have a discussion about the risks and the benefits. Uh, if your GP is not going to give it to you, uh, then of course you would be entitled, if you still want it, to find someone who will. Um, that's, uh, that's your right as a patient. Mary Louise McClaws is a professor in epidemiology at UNSW and an advisor to the World Health Organization. She's questioning the vaccination targets, which are meant to be our ticket to freedom. I spoke to her earlier. Professor McClaws, thank you so much for joining me. We've just heard from young people, and many of them are unsure and anxious, confused about getting the vaccine. Why is the message about getting the jab still not getting through? Deb, I think that they've been neglected, and now all of a sudden um, the authorities are woke to the fact that young people are at enormous risk of Delta. So we need to repackage the message to really focus on them and explain to them that we love them, we don't want them to get sick or die, and please take any vaccine that's offered to you because that will keep you from being hospitalised and keep you from death. And we need to repackage that very rapidly. If they're at all worried about a rare event of thrombosis and thrombocytopenia, if they're very young, then uh, we need to identify how fast we can get uh, Pfizer to them. If it's going to take quite some time, then they need to balance the fear and the reality of Delta with um, a rare event. And the reality of, is... Of AstraZeneca. And the reality is that we are seeing so many young people affected. Tragically, two more people have died, including a 27-year-old, both not vaccinated. We've got teenagers with COVID in ICU. Schools are at the centre of the Queensland cluster and 21 cases there are under the age of 10. In terms of exposure, it is quite frightening. It is. And look, the UK gave us plenty of warning. They've been watching Delta go through their young from the age of five to 24. They've identified that those groups, the young, the adolescent and the young adults, are really at risk of COVID from Delta like never before. And there can't be any prediction of who's going to get complicated Delta. Uh, COVID infection, whether or not they're going to go into intensive care or hospital. So the message is for everybody, including the authorities, start focusing on young adults and adolescents and then start thinking about vaccinating those as young as 12. Uh, because we really do need to understand that when they're at school, they're at great risk because Delta has worked out how to get around the young um, immune system. And we used to think that Delta couldn't get into kids because they didn't have very many receptor sites. Well, this variant has le learned how to do this. And broadly, we've got the lockdowns, but we've got the number of infections still rising and the New South Wales Premier warns they'll go higher still. Have we lost control of this Delta outbreak? Well, it looked as if, as if we have lost control. Um, when you have Delta in the community, one Delta infection is one too many in the community. And that's why you need to go into very early lockdown. But there are many things that the authorities can still do. And that is identify people at work um, before they go on the work floor, the shop floor, and test them early so that they don't go home and spread it into their household, so they don't inadvertently spread it to their workmates. So rapid so really antigen testing? To... Yep, the very best ones. Now, there's some fairly ordinary ones, but some of them are excellent and have the same performance as a PCR when the person isn't symptomatic. And they take uh, 10 to 15 minutes and a fraction of the price and their performance improves dramatically as you keep repeating on the same people every day. And some of the performance is over 99%. Mm. So that's one way of doing it. Another way is taking the vaccine to organisations, to businesses that employ a lot of people so that you can test and vaccinate at the same time. And what about restrictions? Do we need to go tougher? Because we've got places like Bunnings, the reject shops, still open, still considered essential. Should the lockdowns be harder? Those shops should have been closed, except for Bunnings. I mean, you know, if you have a leak in a, in, in a, um, in a ceiling or if you have, a, you know, have a, 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 a problem that you can fix, then those shops should be open. But the but other ones are probably not deemed essential. 
And what about playgrounds? Because I posted a picture on social media of my daughter in a playground and a lot of people were questioning why they were even open in Greater Sydney. They're not in lockdown, they're not open in lockdown Queensland. They also weren't in Victoria and they weren't in New South Wales last year. Should we be shutting the playgrounds? Oh, look, I, th I think children, particularly if you live in a very small apartment, you need to be able to get children out. One of the downsides of playgrounds is that parents like to talk to each other. And when they start talking to each other, they like to drop their masks so that they can be heard. That sort of thing can spread it. The kids sadly also need to wear a mask when they're playing in that playground because we now know that Delta can be spread between children. Making a five-year-old so, wear a mask though is next to an impossible task. Correct. So perhaps what we should be doing is taking turns to go into the into the playground areas. So in terms of the vaccination targets, they've been set, we've seen the modelling hopefully to give us back our freedoms, but can we realistically get there? Can we realistically get to that target of 70, 80 per cent of the eligible adult population vaccinated? Well, I'm going to tell you something that will make you you uh, a little bit surprised. That 70 and 80 per cent is only of the adult population. That uh, translates into 56 per cent of the adult population to, to 64%. So that's about one in two and one in three people will still be um, at risk of COVID. That's far too high. We need to be aspirational and go for 80% of the, all po the population. So not just so adults, the to, entire population. Correct, the entire population. And that's a very big ask. It's highly aspirational, but we can do this. When could we get there though? We need over 200,000 injections per day to be able to get there by the end of the year. We probably may not get there until March next year. But it's not safe enough to say that one in three people who don't have the vaccine is safe enough to start opening up all the borders. It's not. It's not good enough, one in three. Mm -hmm. It's just not showing a duty of care. So I would be opening up vaccines to everybody with a priority of the 20 to 39 year olds who get more infection and spread more. And then another priority group of the 12 uh, to 15 year olds. Well, let's hope we get there sooner rather than later. Professor McClaws, thanks for joining us.